Welcome to the courtroom at the School of Law, Social Science and Communications. This room is utilised by our students for a number of purposes. In particular, we can use it for our students who are preparing for mooting competitions, and we have mooting competitions both internally and externally. And later in this video clip, you'll see our students practising for a moot competition that they're soon to take part in. We've also utilised this room to undertake mock bully courts for children from primary school who we get to take different roles within the court so we will have some of the school children undertaking the roles of barrister and solicitor, some of the school children acting as the bully or witnesses and some of the school children acting as the judge or magistrates. Um, and we have found that this is a really useful exercise in building the confidence in children to demonstrate their oral presentation skills, but also to bring a very important issue um, to them in a very practical and meaningful way. With our students, we can utilise this room by enabling them to practise their um, moot, to practise different presentation skills. Those exercises can then be videoed and members of staff can give feedback to the students and of course the students can watch the video and see how they can have improved. I'm now going to hand over to two of our students who are studying on the LLB Honours Programme. They are Stephanie and Tobias who are both in Level 2 in their second year of the degree and they're going to show a part of a moot. A moot is a mock court exercise and in this exercise, one of our students will take the role of the prosecution, seeking to establish guilt of the defendant, and the other student will take the role of the defence barrister. This part of the courtroom is known as the bench, and this is where the magistrates or the judge would sit. As you can see, currently it's set up for three magistrates. Additionally, we have to have the coat of arms because any court operating in England and Wales has to display this court of, coat of arms in order to be um, in session as a court. As I've said, this court currently is set up as a magistrate's court and this desk here is where the court clerk would sit and his task is to advise the magistrates because the magistrates are not legally qualified it is only the court clerk who is legally qualified and his job is to advise the magistrates on issues of law. Um, behind the court clerk would sit the solicitors and barristers um, and over here is the um, defendant's box and some courts would also be set up with a separate witness box. Um, lastly, as you can see, we have a door to my right which would be the door that would be used by the defendant. And on the other side, we have the door that would be used for the magistrates or judge um, and a place behind there where the magistrates or judge would be able to retire to um, deliberate before delivering their verdict. So over to Toby and Stephanie. If it pleases your honour, my name is Mr Tobias Haynes. I am appearing on behalf of the Crown for the prosecution of Mrs Samantha. I put before you, your honour, that the charge presented to Mrs Samantha is the most heinous of all crimes, that of murder, and she is indeed guilty of this appalling crime. Would your honour benefit from the facts of this case? Yes. Your honour, Mrs Samantha was married to Edgar for seven years. Over the three years previous to what's happened, Edgar was taken to go out every evening drinking and of an evening he'd come back late at night drunk and acting quite violently. Samantha frequently scolds him and he has a violent temper and on some occasions he's hit Samantha forcefully. On other occasions he's forced Samantha to engage in sexual intercourse with him against her protests. Samantha recently sought help from a counsellor who advised her to leave Edgar and move into a hostel for battered wives. 
The next time Ed had come home drunk, he staggered into the bedroom and Samantha stated that she was going to leave him. However, Edgar punched her several times, breaking some of her teeth and cutting her lip, badly bruising her. Eventually, Edgar went to sleep and ultimately Samantha was sobbing in the corner of the room. Later on, she got quite drunk herself. She went outside and she took a hammer from the garden shed. She returned to the bread room and hit Edgar several times in the head, killing him. She then calmly called the police and said, you'd better come quickly, I've just murdered my husband. Samantha was arrested and questioned the next day and made a statement to the police. In the statement, she explained that she couldn't take any more and she was told the counsellor herself that she would kill Edgar if she ever hurt him again. So, therefore, Your Honour, Samantha was charged with murder and in the defence, which my colleague will later go on to state, she has pleaded that Edgar provoked her. Firstly, Your Honour, I will prove beyond reasonable doubt that Mrs Samantha is guilty of this crime. Your Honour, I will put before you the basic elements of murder, the actus reus and the mens rea, which must be satisfied in order to convict Mrs. Samantha. I respectfully submit, Your Honour, reported in 3rd Instance 47, Lord Chief Justice Coates' definition of murder as Murder is when a man of sound memory and of the age of discretion unlawfully killeth within any county of the realm any reasonable creature in rerum natura under the king's peace with malice aforethought either expressed by the party or implied by law. The actus reus is the unlawful killing and the mens rea is malice aforethought. Firstly, dealing with the actus reus, Your Honour. This is a straightforward issue. I submit that the actus reus is easily satisfied as it is clear that Mrs Samantha killed her husband by striking him on the head with a hammer and she has admitted this herself. Next, Your Honour, I respectfully submit that the mens rea is satisfied. I respectfully submit the case of Regina against Maloney, reported in Volume 1 of the All England Law Reports for the year 1985, page 1025. Is Your Honour familiar with the facts of this case? Yes. I, res I respectfully submit that it was held that malice in for the forethought is either the intent to kill, the expressed malice, or to the intent to commit grievous bodily harm, which is the implied malice. Your Honour, to put it simply, the mens rea is certainly satisfied. Firstly, intent. Where intent is questioned, the case that applies is Regina against Woolen, reported in Volume 4 of the England Reports for the year 1998, page 103. Your Honour, are you familiar with the facts of this case? Yes. The first question is whether death or serious injury is a virtual certainty. Firstly, it is certain that when someone is hit over the head with this hammer several times, death or serious injury is a virtual certainty. Next, the question is whether the defendant themselves knew that death or serious injury was a virtual certainty. Surely no person in their right mind would ever perceive that hitting someone over the head with a hammer several times would not constitute at least serious injury. However, these two questions are put forward to the jury to decide, and both must be satisfied, and if they are, the jury may find intention, but they do not have to. The next question is whether there was intent to kill or commit grievous bodily harm. I respectfully submit on it that there was intent to kill, as Mrs Samantha went to the shed to fetch the hammer. This is proof of premeditation, and therefore she had intent to kill, and it is almost certain that she intended death as she hit him on the head with the hammer. The Director of Public Prosecutions against Smith reported in the year 1961 for the appeal cases at page 290 held, grievous bodily harm is really serious harm. And Regina against Saunders for the year 1985, criminal law reports at page 230, held the omission of really was unimportant. And this was again confirmed in the case of Jan Duran for the year 1998. Therefore, Your Honour, it is easily satisfied that either really serious harm or serious harm is satisfied, and that Mrs Samantha did indeed intend to kill her husband. Therefore, Your Honour, the prosecution concludes their case for the actress race and the men's road murder, and I respectfully submit to my colleague. Thank you. My lady, my name is Miss Williams, and I appear for the defendant, Samantha. The defence accept that Samantha killed her husband, However, it is submitted that she should not be found guilty of murder, but should instead be found guilty of manslaughter, because it is submitted that Samantha was provoked into losing her self-control, and it was during this loss of self-control 
that she killed her husband. My lady, I shall be making three submissions in furtherance of this argument. Firstly, that Samantha did lose her self-control. Secondly, that the delay between the provoking act and the killing does not negate a successful defense of provocation. And thirdly, that a reasonable person would have acted as the defendant did. My lady, may I proceed to my first submission? Yes. My lady, a successful defense of provocation requires that the defendant was provoked into losing their self-control. And what a loss of their self-control essentially means is the defendant was so consumed by rage, so completely at the mercy of their emotions, that they were simply unable to stop themselves from killing. In this case, my lady, it was the victim's brutal attack of the defendant that caused the defendant to lose her self-control. My lady, this was in no way a premeditated killing. Violent behaviour is completely uncharacteristic of Samantha. She has no history of violence in her past. And despite enduring three years of physical and emotional abuse by the victim, never once during that time did Samantha ever physically retaliate. Never once during that time did she ever fight back. Furthermore, my lady, it is submitted that the defendant had no intention whatsoever of killing her husband. She was making steps, reasonable and lawful steps, to escape her situation. She had been to see a counsellor, and on the very night itself, she tried to leave him. And so it is submitted, my lady, that this killing was a result of the defendant losing her self-control. May I proceed to my second submission? Please do. My lady, it is submitted that the delay between the provoking act and the killing does not negate a successful defence of provocation. If I may refer your ladyship to the case of R and Alawalia, which is reported in the All England Reports, Volume 4, for the year 1992, at page 889. Is my lady familiar with the facts of this case? Yes. If I may refer your ladyship to the words of Lord Taylor of Gosforth at page 896 of the judgment, where he states, We accept that the subjective element in the defence of provocation would not, as a matter of law, be negative, simply because of the delayed reaction in such cases, provided that there was, at the time of the killing, a sudden and temporary loss of self-control caused by the alleged provocation. My lady, in this case, it is submitted that the defendant was suffering from battered wife syndrome. And this is evidenced by the fact that the defendant endured three years of physical and emotional abuse by the victim, and by the fact that when she went to see a counsellor, the counsellor strongly recommended that she seek refuge in a battered wife home. My lady, the fact that the defendant was suffering from this syndrome is of absolute significance to this case because a person who is suffering from battered wife syndrome does not react to provoking acts in the same way as an ordinary person would. Whereas an ordinary person would have an immediate reaction to a provoking act, somebody who is suffering from battered wife syndrome is far more likely to suffer from a slow burn effect, whereby it may take several hours for the defendant to lose their self-control after the provoking act. On the night of the murder, my lady, the victim subjected the defendant to a particularly brutal and vicious physical attack. He punched her and he broke her teeth. And it is submitted that the fact that the defendant was, as a woman, physically weaker than the victim coupled with the fact that she was suffering from this battered wife syndrome, meant that when she, was, when she endured this physical attack, her immediate reaction to it was to go into a state of shock. And this is evidenced by the fact that after the attack had finished, Samantha was left frozen in the corner of the room, sobbing. And so it is submitted, my lady, that it was not until several hours after the attack had finished 
that Samantha left this state of shock and this state of trauma. It was only when she came out of the traumatic state that she was able to comprehend what had happened to her. It was only then, those hours later, that she realized what the victim had done to her. It was then that she realized that her husband had once again subjected her to physical abuse. But not only that, not only this time had he physically violated her, but this time he had left her with a physical deformity. He had broken her teeth. An everlasting reminder of the physical abuse that he had inflicted upon his wife. And it was upon realizing this that the defendant finally snapped and she lost her self-control and she killed the victim. My lady, may I proceed to my third submission? Yes. My lady, the second requirement of the provocation defense is that the defendant acted as a reasonable person would have done. If I may refer your ladyship to the case of Smith Morgan, which is reported in the All England Reports, Volume 4, for the year 2000, at page 289. Is my lady familiar with the facts of this case? I am familiar with the facts of this case. However, um, I would prefer if you moved on to the case of Hilda Hilda rather than concentrate on the case of Smith. Well, my lady, it, it was the submission of the defence that uh, your ladyship should in fact follow the case of Morgan because of the fact that Smith Morgan was a House of Lords decision whereas Holly was only the Privy Council and so is still only persuasive precedent. Go ahead then. My lady, it was the House of Lords in this case that laid down that the reasonable man should bear all of the characteristics of the defendant. And so it is submitted that Samantha did act as a reasonable person would have done. A person who was suffering from battered wife syndrome, a person who had endured three years of physical abuse, and a person who on the very night itself had just endured a brutal physical attack by the victim. My lady, to conclude, it is accepted that the defendant killed her husband, but this was in no way a premeditated murder. The defendant was provoked into losing her self-control, and she did act as any reasonable person in her situation would have done. And so it is submitted, my lady, that the defence of provocation must succeed, and that your ladyship should find the defendant not guilty of murder, but guilty instead of manslaughter. Unless your ladyship has any further questions, that concludes the case for the defence. Thank you. The court will now adjourn and I will consider the submissions of the prosecution and the defence, following which I will direct the jury on this matter. All rise.